I got into distilling probably like I got into a lot of things at life. Um, circumstance, accident. Um, I was it was probably you know, going on about 15 years ago. Somebody that I work with came into work that day all excited and said he wanted to make sugar shine and uh, wanted me to build him a still to do that. And uh, I had no idea what sugar shine was, and I certainly had no idea of how to build a still. I did a little research and found out that the fundamental distilling that people have been doing for a few thousand years is fairly basic. The technology is not that complicated. Uh, you know, you saw our stills back there, and uh, those were we we built those stills. I built most of them. John built one of them. I proceeded to build the still for him and then uh, he never actually used it. And so and a couple of years went by, I didn't really think much about it. And I was at his house and I saw the still there and said, what are you gonna do with that? And, and uh, he kind of hemmed and hawed and I said, why don't you give it back to me? And uh, so so anyway, I, I got it back and then I, well, I don't know what to do with it. I had never, considered fermenting anything or making beer or wine or any of those kind of things. Um, but I, I do like to make things and I do like to experiment with things and try things. And so I thought, well, I'll just give it a go and see if I can make some. And, you know, simple logic. I thought, what, what should I make? I, sugar shine, you know, just fermenting sugar seemed a little boring, uh, not challenging, I guess you just have to dissolve the sugar and and so so i thought well i'm in kentucky maybe i should make bourbon even though it wouldn't be bourbon if you're doing it in your garage so i you know looked up the rules as well you got to have corn you know 51 percent corn blah 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 all the different criteria so i started <clears throat> experimenting with different recipes and and uh, just kind of for fun and uh you know it's when you when you build a still yourself and the first time that still runs and and the, when something actually comes out of the still it's very exciting oh I, actually it worked another friend of mine said oh i know where this cool old distillery is for sale and uh i guess i have a a, a thing for cool old stuff uh, i have a sort of a, I guess I call it a fascination or interest in uh, how things are made, how people make things, the processes, that's what I've done as a career, as a process engineer. And so when I see old things uh, that people made long, long ago, I, I think about how they made them and it's very interesting to me to, to see what people are capable of. Um, and so the place, and then when I found out it's, it's uh, the old Crow distillery and, and the significance of Dr. James Crow in this industry and his contribution in the uh, standardization, if you will, of the sour mashing process that it's used for most bourbons uh, today. Um, all those things, you know, intrigued me. And so it's a fantastic structure, the property, um, was was uh, Jim Beam bought the distillery in 1987, uh, and the production stopped here in 1985, and um, Beam bought it in 87, and then they sold off this portion here, and then they kept the aging warehouses, the newer aging warehouses, and and continue to use those to this day for aging some of their their bourbon. So we've got we've got us here, and we've got Jim Beam in the middle, and then we have Old Taylor uh, now Castle and Key uh, down the way. So two really two distilleries here, but three different uh, companies located down here. Uh, so so I drove out. You know, friends had places for sale. I drove out here. Um, just something about the place uh, and the history of it was was interesting, and and I never had considered starting a business of distilling. It was simply just for fun, a hobby that I was uh, messing around with. Um, but when I saw the place, then that kind of uh, spurred the idea that, hey, maybe we could start a distillery back again.
So that's how it happened. I bought the property in January of 2014, and uh, we were in the process of getting our federal and state licenses and permits. And then we started distilling here in May of 2015. The road that we're on here, McCracken Pike, uh, you know, if you if you were able to continue on, you'd you'd end up in Frankfurt if you went that way, and if you continued on that way, you'd end up in Versailles. And um, but but it's not a road that you would be on unless you were wanting to go from Versailles to Frankfurt, for example. Uh, and so, you know, I never knew these places were here. I, I don't think a lot of people knew that they were here. Were, were sort of off the beaten path and I try to explain to people that in the 1800s when these distilleries were first established um, you know it was there was no electricity yet there was no natural gas there was no automobiles there was none of the, these things and the distilleries were located here because there's springs so we're in a valley the, the Glens Creek uh, is, is in this valley that runs between the Kentucky River and Versailles. And, and all along that valley, there's springs. And so Woodford Reserve is down there. There's a spring. Uh, Castle and Key, there's a spring. We have a spring. There's, there were additional uh, springs and distilleries in, the, in that time period. There was a number of small distilleries down through this valley. And the water was the reason that the places were built here. And if you look at this place from that time period, you say, well, this location was perfect at that time. We're sort of off the beaten path in the modern world. But at that time, you had spring water coming out of the ground that you could both drink and turn into uh, spirits. You have a creek in the back that you could used to, to grind your grain, to turn your wheel and, and create power for, for that sort of thing. And the village, the town, whatever you want to call it here, is called Millville because there was quite a number of mills down here at that time period and because of the creek. And then you've got the river. And the river would be analogous to the interstate highway of the time period. You could take your product that you have in barrels and put it on a wagon and, and get it down to the to the river and and from there the Kentucky River meets the Ohio River which meets the Mississippi River which can eventually get you to uh, New Orleans and then from New Orleans you could get on a boat and and your product could go around Florida and all up the east coast and so you have access to to all the major markets because at that time period there were no roads and you you weren't going to take barrels or product from here and, and try to get it back across the, the mountains to the east. So the river was a convenient way to do that. So so three sources of water that were crucial and, and significant at that time period. And so that's why these distilleries were built here. Dr. James Crow started the brand Old Crow in 1835. He was a distiller at what is now Woodford Reserve. It was pepper distillery at that time period. And so he never he never would have seen this facility because this facility was built in the 1870s. And my guess is that, well, this part's not a guess. We know that Colonel Taylor was in the distilling business uh, prior to building these distilleries, the four distilleries that still exist. Old Taylor, Old Crow, what's now Buffalo mm -hmm. Trace, and then Old Grandad. So what was happening at that time period in the 1800s was, first of all, the development of steam power. Okay, uh, At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, steam power w was coming into uh, prominence, and uh, the ability to use steam to heat your still to cook your grains and do that sort of thing was was a huge huge advancement because prior to that time you would have had to kept a fire burning uh, literally under your stills under your cookers and so it's very labor intensive you saw in our process back there 
The stills, we use propane so we don't have to keep the fire burning. It, it burns and once you've got it lit, you can walk away from it. Um, but but when steam power came, now, you, now there's opportunity to have your heat over here in your boiler and direct the heat to a device, a cooker, or a still, and, uh, and, and control that heat, which is very important in distilling. And so that allowed for the development of a, a new distilling apparatus. I mean, after a few thousand years of basically the same technology, 1800s uh, came the, what's known as a coffee still, named after the gentleman who patented it. His last name was Coffee. And it's now known as a continuous column still. So the difference is our stills are a batch process. You put the liquid in, we saw back there, you put the liquid in, you heat it up, uh, and then you distill out the, the uh, alcohol. And at the end of that, you have to drain the still and refill it and, and start over. The continuous still has a, has a constant uh, feed of the fermented liquids in. It has a constant output of the distilled spirits and it runs continuously. It's not a batch process. So uh, once you start that still, you just continue to keep feeding fermented liquid in and the, dis the distilled spirits uh, continue to come out. So it's 24 seven. It's a significantly more efficient, significantly more volume. You know, distilleries went from this scale of what, like we are here where you're making a few barrels a week to the potential to make uh, hundreds of barrels a day. In today's world, you know, thousand barrels a day. So, so, so dramatic, dramatic leap in, in terms of uh, distillation in the process. So what we do here is we've kind of gone backwards. We, we went back to the old school way and said, well, let's keep it simple. Let's use pot stills. Um, they're significantly less efficient in terms of their output. Uh, the production volumes are, are less. But I, I believe that the way we do it creates a unique product and that that product is, would be similar to what Dr. Crow would have done uh, back in his time period. So um, there's a saying here, when, when everybody comes to work here, they learn right away. I said, look, everything's a trade-off. When you look at the process, how we do the process, as I explained back there, this is how we do it. I'm not saying that it's the best. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying this is what we do. And I can tell you why we do that. There's a reason that we do certain things. And, uh, and, and again, I'm not saying that reason is the right reason. I'm saying it's, this is our choice. And each of those choices has a trade-off. So for example, uh, when distilling went away from direct heat on a still to steam, which is indirect heat, uh, I believe that the nature of the out, the, the product changed. So it, the analogy is, is this, you put, you put something on your stove and you're cooking food as you're cooking the food, the heat is, uh, let's say caramelizing the Maillard reactions. You're, you're browning the, the materials you're, you're changing that and that changes the flavor. Whereas if you, had it on a, a double boiler where you have the steam underneath and you have the indirect heat, I don't believe the food's gonna taste the same. Okay, so the cooking process is, is changing the nature of the, of the product. So having direct heat on the stills, the drawback is we can't put grains in. So most distilleries that are using steam heat are now uh, distilling on the grain, meaning leaving the grain in the still. And since you don't have direct heat, you don't have to worry about it burning or scorching or anything like that. So we have to separate the grains because if we put that in the still with direct heat, it would burn. And having done that once, uh, I can assure you that that makes really terrible whiskey. Okay. So we have to do extra steps to eliminate the, or, or, or I should say minimize the possibility that we're going to uh, scorch or burn something in the still uh, because we have direct heat. Okay. But 
it's my contention anyway, my belief that the direct heat gives us a different flavor profile that, that uh, is, I don't know, how to, have a hard time putting words to it sometimes, but but fuller flavor, just there's more going on. Whereas sometimes I, when I have a product that's made uh, with indirect heat, the the flavor just seems kind of I don't know how to say it, flat or or just not very complex. There's as many opinions and ideas and thoughts or whatever you want to call it about how to best do this as there are people doing it. You know, you read anybody, you read an article about somebody else and they're gonna say, this is this is what we do. And then somebody else is gonna say, this is what we do. And and sometimes people are gonna say, well, you, you can't do this or you have to do this. And those are all the things that I experimented with when I was first starting. Somebody said, well, you, you should never use wild yeast. You don't, over and over and over, I heard that. Don't, you don't wanna use wild yeast, you don't wanna use wild yeast. And I thought, <clears throat> Humans have been using wild yeast for who we don't know how long before written history that fermentation occurred naturally. No one understood what was happening until the microscope was invented. And it wasn't until Pasteur uh, understood what was really taking place during fermentation, which wasn't until uh, the 1800s, as I recall. So um, my reasoning said, if people have been doing this for thousands of years what could be wrong with that and you know nature does it that's what i explained out there in fermentation Na nature takes care of it we don't have to really do a lot uh, to help that if we didn't add yeast to those fermentations they would spontaneously ferment um, so um, I, I guess i guess the philosophy we take here is keep it simple it doesn't have to be complicated uh, certainly the science behind the process, there's a lot of complications, but most of that you you can't influence. You, there's, you can't really change what's happening. So, um, you know, just let, let it do what it does and try to keep the process as simple as possible. What I really work hard to do is is to separate fact from story and so I try to say look here's what I know as a fact and here's what I've heard which isn't a fact and uh, so there are a variety of stories around the demise of Old Crow uh, I, I've never heard that it was lost yeast that I don't think that was what happened um, <clears throat> I think and, and I've heard that uh, what I, well, I'll go back to it. what I know is there was a renovation here in 1964. Uh, after prohibition ended in 1935, National Distillers bought the distillery and uh, also did a significant renovation, increasing capacity. So the the key to that capacity was the steam. Everything here was steam powered. All the buildings, all the warehouses, Colonel Taylor believed that heated warehouses uh, aged the product more quickly and effectively and, and, and say he's right because he's, he was capturing a six months period uh, where the temperature is too low to actually allow for the uh, maturation in a, in a barrel. So anyway, 1935, four big steam boilers back there, Westinghouse understokers, massive capability to produce steam, right? 1960s, bourbon's booming. Uh, they need to increase the capacity. So they put in a new boiler at that time and they changed some, they added some uh, fermenters. And so they were, they, they expanded capacity at that time. The story is that somewhere during that process, somebody made a mistake in a calculation and the tank size and the proportions of water to grain and so and set back, which is the sour mash process, were thrown off and, and the result uh, didn't taste good. And, um, you know, again, the story is when employees notified uh, national management and were told to you know, keep, keep, keep going. Right? 
and uh, and that's you know the product went then from top shelf to bottom shelf. <clears throat> but I don't I don't think the story is that simple. And when you ask that when you ask that question, then I'd have to go back and I'd have to say, look, first of all, the grains we use today are really probably not a lot like the grains that were used back then. The name's the same, but but it wasn't until uh, the 19th, 1900s, the 20th century, that uh, the, the legal definitions for bourbon were even established. Initially, it was just whiskey. And that uh, initially in the United States, uh, what we call rye whiskey today would have been the predominant whiskey because rye was the predominant grain. Modern corn is, is a more modern thing. Um, you know, corn, I was just watching a, a, a show on the History Channel about corn, and I said, what I already knew, corn, as we know it today, isn't a natural thing. It's a man-made creation that we've hybridized the, the uh, corn over time to create what we have today. So the grains wouldn't have been the same. The process wouldn't have been the same. So yes, if I say we're trying to recreate Old Crow, I could say, but we don't have a continuous still, and the Old Crow distillery here was a continuous still. Now, when Dr. Crow started the brand in 1835, he was using pot stills, uh, but he also probably wasn't using corn. He was probably using rye, and it wasn't called bourbon. It was just Old Crow whiskey, right, the initial product. Um, so, and then prohibition came, and and uh, certainly, you know, if you're if you're going to do a, a a reset, okay, you've had this long gap in there, and any existing customer certainly forgot what you had before, and you're going to reset and create something new. Then you've got a new decision to say, what should our recipe be? If, we're starting over we can we can start from scratch and that's that's another one of those decisions a trade-off decision to say look you you have an opportunity to create this recipe the the mash bill if you will um, but guess what once you have your customers acclimated to that you're pretty much going to have to stick to that forever and so there's two decisions there's a quality side decision and there's a cost side decision and you know, you have to look at it and say, well, of the three grains, corn, rye, and barley, <clears throat> uh, corn is by far the cheapest of those grains. Um, it produces uh, the most fermentable sugars of those grains, and it tastes pretty good. So wouldn't you create a recipe that's, uh, let's say, higher in corn content than the other grains? Now, the other end of that, uh, you have this grain, which is the barley malt. And this grain in a bourbon recipe primarily has one job, and that is to convert starches into fermentable sugars. There are enzymes present in the grain that convert those uh, long chain uh, starch molecules into uh, fermentable sugars. So if I look at the recipe and I say that grain over on this end of the of, of my recipe uh, most people would say five percent is the minimum ten percent is really all you need to get the job done so somewhere between five and ten percent is going to be where that falls we know over here corn has to be at least 51 percent corn but corn is less expensive so let me bump that up to say oh 70 percent which is what old crow was 70 20 10. it was it was like right at the middle of the road recipe as far as bourbon recipes go Okay, 70, 20, 10. So, so when we say recreate, there's that part. What was the proportion of grain? But there's also the part of the sour mash process and how much setback do you put back in there. There's also the yeast and there's also barrel entry proof. Uh, Old Crow went into the barrel at 115. So those are all choices you get to make, okay, in terms of what the final product's going to be. Uh, Typically, the lower proof that you go into the barrel, um, the um, let's say sweeter, more mellow flavors are going to come out. But the uh, maturation process can take longer. The higher proof you go into the barrel, legal limit 125. Uh, in my opinion, you tend to 
risk pulling some harshness out of the barrels. Some of the tannins can be a, a little bit bitter. Um, so, so the sweet spot I had determined in my own experimentation was around 115, that you get kind of the benefits of a little bit lower proof, um, but you also get, um, you know, the maturation doesn't take forever. But, but that's a financial trade-off. You're, you're not maximizing the value of that barrel because legally you can go in the barrel at 125, okay? And so, again, that's that decision to say, well, I'm not going to maximize the use of that asset per se, but the outcome is what I want it to be. So that's the trade-off. That's the, the decision point. Uh, so, so what, you know, there's a, other things happening in the world of bourbon. The 60s was a peak time and the 80s was kind of a, a bust, a, a low period. And um, so, you know, the, there's also that possibility that the, the recipe was adjusted to, to accommodate the financial uh, situation at the time. So, um, I, I, th the short answer is I don't know for sure what happened. I've heard the rumors uh, and the stories, uh, but I don't know um, exactly what happened. You know, in the beginning, when I bought the place, part of it, part of it, of course, was the history and, and a desire to preserve uh, what's still here. Uh, there was, you know, you know, Beam bought the place and they sold off the part. And you, ha you really have to, you have to go back to that time period and understand the circumstances, okay? In the 1980s, in 1985, this distillery closed. They stopped production. and. Uh, the, the challenge in a distillery, uh, a whiskey distillery anyway, is you're putting out product today in anticipation for some sales in the future, uh, years in the future, and the continuous column still doesn't care what your sales are doing. It puts out a steady stream in a constant state. And so if your output remains the same, but your sales declines, what ends up happening is you fill up all your barrel warehouses and then you have nowhere to put your product. And, and so uh, the dilemma, the drawback of this location down here, while it was perfect in the 1800s, uh, they ran out of land. They continued to build aging warehouses uh, until um, they ran out of land. And so all the newer buildings, uh, Jim Beam maintained those, uh, kept those in their aging uh, product over there. And then they sold off this part. At that time period in the 80s, there was no bourbon trail, there was no bourbon tourism, there was, you know, people didn't come visit distilleries. This was a factory. This distillery produced 400 barrels a day, and it was a big industrial complex at that time period. And so there was no real sense of preserve history or whatever. It was business. And so, so this part was sold to some people in the salvage business who came in and, and basically took out metals, you know, stainless, copper, brass, whatever metals were recyclable, and uh, started demolishing buildings. And so, uh, for example, the front area here, which is all grass now, there was actually three aging warehouses out front here, and there were several around back that have been torn down for the, for the materials. And we, we repurposed that. So the wood you see in this room uh, was all salvaged from the buildings. We didn't take them buildings down. The wood was all here left behind when, when I bought it. So we used that wood. Uh, we used the wood to, to build our stuff, our tables and whatnot. Um, so anyway, long story is um, certainly my desire in the beginning was to try to preserve the history of what's here and uh, the legacy of, of the brand and the facility. Uh, so I, my business plan was like, was a three phase plan. It said phase one is establish production, establish a distillery, a business. Phase two is, is preservation of the existing structures so that further damage isn't occurring. And then <clears throat> phase three is 
his uh, restoration to actually uh, bring it back. And, and we've got two distilleries down the road here as, as a model for that. Woodford Reserve back in the 90s went through exactly the same process. It had been abandoned for quite some time. Um, it was in very rough condition and uh, Brown Foreman brought that back uh, to life. And then Castle and Key, uh, which was built, the old Taylor Distillery built at the same time period as this one and uh, roughly in the same condition, very rough condition, neglected for you know, 30 years or, or more. And, um, and so they've done a nice job of, of bringing that back to life. But if you drive down there, you can see they've still got a long way to go. <laughs> that uh, Mother Nature's relentless. And, uh, you know, we do the best we can to try to take back some of, some of the property from, from Mother Nature and then maintain it uh, as best we can. She works 24-7. We're only here 14-7. So. Uh, but, but ideally, I would like nothing more than to, to preserve the structures. The, the distillery is just a beautiful building. The space inside is fantastic. Um, you know, it's, it's costly adventure because all the electrics, all the electric stuff has been ripped out. Any, you know, plumbing or anything like that was, was salvaged for scrap. Uh, and, and you would never, never be able to bring it back to what it was. It just, that would be totally impractical because the, the part of the issue with these distilleries is they were, they were constructed in the 1870s, and by the time the 1980s came along, they were technologically obsolete. So you got sa sales in the tank, uh, obsolete technology, it would have cost, in those days, tens of millions of dollars to, to bring it back into uh, current uh, level. And um, it, it, you don't need the capacity and you don't have the sales, why would you invest tens of millions of dollars in a facility? I mean, that just wouldn't happen. I think what we're known for here is that um, we, we provided some knowledge and understanding, I think, that uh, you don't necessarily get at some of the other distilleries. You probably have seen it because I think if you go to the craft distilleries and you're probably talking to uh, people who do the work, who understand the work, you know, as you yeah. go to a big distillery and clearly the person doing the tour isn't the person who runs the cooker or the stills or, or the bottling line or any of that. Um, but here, everybody who comes to work here basically learns to do all aspects of the, of the process. And, uh, and so that's, that's beneficial because I can go out there and, and I can say, Hey, Justin, would you do the 12 o'clock tasting? Because I'm going to be tied up. And Stuart didn't come in. I got somebody else who can step in and do it. Uh, Justin knows how to do pretty much everything we do here. Um, and so that, that's kind of our deal is everybody learns how to do everything. And, um, and if, if you have the desire to, create a new recipe. For example, Tom came to me a, a, a month or so ago and said, hey, uh, have you ever experimented with red corn, for instance? I said, no, I haven't, but here's the deal. Cost quality, right? Red corn costs more. I know that much. Uh, does it produce a better product that can command a premium price? If so, that's a smart decision or whatever. But hey, you know what? We can buy a ton of corn and do a couple of batches and experiment with it. It's not a, uh, it's not a million dollar decision. It's not something that we have to agonize over whether we want to do it. So we, we tried it and he came up with a couple of different recipes that we uh, distilled. And uh, one of those was, uh, is our hundred percent corn only bourbon recipe, but using the red corn and a blue corn and a white corn instead of just our yellow corn. And, uh, he, he decided we should call that patriotic cob because it's red, white, and blue. And then we thought, well, let's 
release that on the 4th of July and uh, we'll call it the patriotic cob and hey, maybe we'll distill that once a year on the 4th of July every year and release it on the 4th of July. So so that's how ideas happen around here. Somebody, somebody says, hey, can we try this? And I said, sure, let's try. First of all, let me just say that I, I don't know that craft distilleries are revolutionizing the industry. Certainly, uh, if we make a comparison to craft breweries, um, which is oftentimes done, um, you know, beer in the United States was pretty bad at one point. I mean, you know, everyone else in the world, you, if you went to Europe, the Europeans would always say, there's two things in the United States that that are not very good and bread and beer were the two things. You go to Europe and you get these wonderful breads and you, you get these beers, all these different varieties. So, so I think it was fairly easy for craft breweries to come online and create some unique products that consumers really enjoyed, okay? But you see, bourbon wasn't the same. Bourbon was not bad, it was never bad. It was just stodgy or, or just set in its ways. Because you know, 20, 30 years ago, if you went to the liquor store, e each of the major distilleries had one product. You know, There was one version of Maker's Mark, there was one version of Jack Daniels, or, right. you know? And now everybody's kind of explored. Now maybe that's a result of craft, but, but I think it started before that because you, you know, your, your single barrels or your barrel strength uh, things started many 20 30 years ago okay and so I, th I think it's a natural progression and i think all the big major distilleries now have small batches and single barrel products and and uh, all these different versions so so the big players in this business always made good products i said they always made cheap products the lower end stuff it, there's a market for that it wasn't necessarily really good bourbon but it wasn't intended to be good bourbon. It was intended to be an expensive bourbon. Uh, and they all produce, uh, you know, middle road products and higher end products. So that they've got the range covered. And so um, it, there's been some criticism, I think, in, in terms of craft that craft distilleries, that craft distilleries haven't done for bourbon what uh, craft breweries did for beer. And I think that's a fair, a fair statement that, that I've had uh, a number of products from craft distilleries that just didn't seem to hit the mark. It just for whatever reason, uh, they you know, in some cases they weren't really very good. In some cases they were okay, just really not something that I I care for. And I think that uh, it it's going to be interesting going into the future uh, as more and more distilleries come online and more and more there's more and more competition for uh, shelf space and for visitors um, that um, you know are, are some of these places not going to survive because the, there's going to be an abundance of, of products and the products maybe aren't up to snuff or uh, certainly we can't produce things at the price point of the big distilleries so that's a disadvantage that we have so we have to create products that that are in that sort of premium price point range and that consumers have to perceive them to be that right. we can't make something that tastes just okay uh and and try to uh charge that price so uh it'd be an interesting question and and uh, i think as we grow and as we increase our uh, capacity is the challenge of trying to maintain, you know, what what we provide in in these products in terms of the quality or or um, you know, what however you want to say that, but what the product is and what it represents, and and I, I think that's always a challenge is how do you grow and increase but still maintain that, and so I think. Um, and that's a question I don't have an answer for because it's, you know, we can replicate what we have currently, but each still back there and each still going into the future, even if we were to build it almost exactly the same, it's still not going to give you exactly the same outcome. 
So, you know, I, I don't, I don't often sit around and think about what my legacy is going to be. Um, it's not just me. I would like nothing more than for this this place to uh, exist and to allow people to come. And uh, so, so we've talked about the future for the distillery to say, look, part of that facility has to be sort of like a museum, you know, where the boilers are and where some of the old equipment is. It's just really cool to go and look at it and I wouldn't want to tear that out. It, and frankly, the space isn't uh, conducive to using for what we would have as a distillery anyway. So, so that space would be more of a on the tour in a museum. And so I could picture 100 years from now, people coming and looking at the 1935 boilers and going, man, how did they ever how did they ever figure out how to do that way back then before they had you know computers um and then part of this part of the space and the facility is is analogous to a dungeon it was it was uh you know everything everything was steam powered so they had these steam engines there and you know so they would have a room like this room that had would have a steam engine in it with with a big shaft uh, that would go up and turn the agitator in the cooker, for example. And so you, you know, there's these spaces down in the underground of the distillery that have no practical value, or at least none that I can see at this at this point. And so, um, yeah, I, I can imagine, you know, even hopefully not a hundred years from now, hopefully sooner is being able to you know, clean that place up and, and uh, preserve it and have people be able to go into there and experience that. There's just, there's something about old things and old places that just have an appeal to, to humans. And you go to Europe and you're in the middle of, you know, buildings that were built in the 1500s. And it's just something about the sense of that that, that we appreciate. So um, I'd like to be able to have that happen at least in my lifetime, have it underway, certainly. And it, it, it's a never, it would be a never ending process because you know, whatever you do, you have to maintain it and you have to continue to put some effort into it. See what so what Tom was barreling back there right now is this one uh, called sweet. That one is a uh, weeded bourbon, so corn, wheat, and barley. Or where's our OCD? Somebody keeps moving them on. This is kind of our signature bourbon. This is the first one that we uh, distilled here, and um, what we did, which is a little different as well, is uh, we went back into the distillery with some buckets of mash and we placed those buckets in various locations and uh, trying to catch some of the yeast from the old distillery there so that we could uh, use some of the uh, yeast. And uh, we put a bucket down in fermenter number five and that's the only uh, bucket that survived that ordeal because there are pigeons and raccoons and possums and, <laughs> but, but the fermenters are, are about 25 feet deep number one and covered so we could put the bucket down in there and, and it would be protected so we captured yeast in fermenter number five and back to back to the fermentation part i should have said to you um we just we just transfer yeast from one batch to the next and <clears throat> all the distilleries are really doing that as part of the sour mash process there's two stages to sour mash one is the liquid from the steel goes back into the next cooking batch and that's a pH adjustment process and then the second part of that is the transference of live active yeast from one batch to the next to kind of kick start that fermentation process so <clears throat> excuse me we don't um, we don't use purchased yeast for the fermentation we just so the First ones we saw over there that were cooked yesterday, sometime later today, they'll be over here and we'll take yeast from the previous one and we'll put it in, in that one, okay? 
So that's uh, sweet, no CD. Then this one, um, this is this is really our uh, effort to to recreate what uh, was happening here. I mean, this is the old Crow Distillery. It was built in the 1870s uh, by Colonel E.H. Taylor and his uh, group. And uh, Colonel Taylor was pretty pretty prominent in the business. And built Old Taylor Distillery, Old Crow Distillery, what's now called Buffalo Trace, and uh, old granddad in Frankfurt. So those are the four distilleries that he was responsible for that, that still exist. Um, there's three others that he was involved in that have been demolished uh, that don't exist any longer. So so anyway, this Cuervito Vivo, Cuervito is a little crow and Vivo means to be alive. So basically it means the little crow lives. Uh, and so that that's one that we created and uh, released that one just in the about March of 2020. And then we have uh, also, uh, we did a 100% corn bourbon. That was uh, simple. We, somebody forgot to order rye. And so <laughs> that would have been me. And uh, since we didn't have any, then John suggested, what if we just used 100% corn? I said, okay, let's give that a try. And so that created the product Corn only bourbon, so 100% corn. Uh, we do rum here as well. This is this is kind of our classic uh, rum, Prohibition Kentucky rum, made from molasses. And then we've got we got a new version here, uh, Captain Bonnie. So we're kind of rebranding that one. But uh, those rums we just still here, and also our agave spirit, uh, known as Cantila. We can't call it tequila because we're not in Mexico, but we can call it Kentila because we're in Kentucky. And uh, we have a few other things here too. Uh, so we, we, we do source a vodka and we source a rye whiskey and then we have another uh, bourbon that we source from MGP up in Indiana. So got quite a few products here, but, but all of these products here we distill here on site.